Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Dordowski. I'm the Executive Director of the Global Energy Management Program here at CU Denver. Uh, we're excited to have you all as a part of our uh, On the Road to Energy Transformation series. This is the second part of that series, um, focusing on electrification and supply chain impacts. Um, we're so um, honored to have our two panelists with us here today, Jill Inglecox and Natasha Herring. So thanks to you both for um, being our expert panelists today. We're just gonna make, give everybody just a few minutes to make sure they're jumping on the call, just the next minute here, and then we will get kicked off. Thirty seconds or so, and then we'll get moving on to our questions. And perfect. So we're excited, as I mentioned, to have this to be the second part of our web series. Um, it's something that we think is very important um, to do for our community, which is have um, public education as part of. Uh, our mission. Um, and so this is the second part of a three part series. The first one really focused on markets. Um, this one's focusing a little bit more on um, the electrification, the supply chain side and how COVID has impacted that or transformed um, that, that sector. And then the third part is gonna be uh, more specifically on the strategy side, how this has obviously been a black swan event um, at multiple levels uh, for the energy sector. And so we wanna have some key takeaways of lessons learned, um, as well as um, maybe how we can plan for some of these uncertain times in the future. Um, and so one of the reasons um, we wanted to do this, as I mentioned, is we're part of a, a public institution and it's part of our mission um, to put uh, information and education out there um, to our community, which are our stakeholders, which is the, the business community, our students, alumni, um, but also the wider public at large. And so that's really um, the purpose we're serving here. Um, so one of the things I wanted just to mention briefly um, is that um, we've kind of focused on three areas here at CU Denver um, in our energy programming. We focus on graduate education, professional energy education, and public education. And that piece is really important because I know um, in the energy sector right now, um, it can be tough times um, depending on where you sit, um, but there's also a lot of opportunity. Um, and I also encourage people who have a lot of time on their hands right now um, to really think about how either you can retool um, where your skill sets fit in, um, and that we have a lot of um, offerings for you, whether it's free all the way to the professional level um, and a lot of hybrid and online. And I, we just wanna let you know we're here to support you, whether it's through webinars um, or any different levels of education. So just a little plug there. So please stay tuned uh, for anything we can share or let us know if there are topics or areas that you think um, you would like to learn about. Um, with that, um, I want to make sure um, to introduce our distinguished speakers um, today. Uh, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of their bios, but I'm certainly gonna let them introduce themselves as well. Um, and then right before I kick it off to them and hand it over, do you have a quick poll question? Um, just to make sure um, everybody is um, engaging or paying attention, um, but also so we can have a great conversation. So let's just, scroll here. I don't want to miss anything. I know these two ladies very well, um, but just want to make sure we cover all their high-level credentials. So our first is Jill Ingle Cox. So she's the director of the Jaisea Institute out at NREL, which is the Joint Institute for Strategic Energy Analysis, which I rarely remember the full acronym, um, what it means. Um, so she has over 25 years of experience um, in energy, and that's from um, renewables to oil and gas. So she's an engineer by trade and training, um, but has um, really diversified um, from that more technical role into a much more strategic level all over the years and worked across the globe, um, spending a lot of time in um, the Middle East um, and Asia. Um, and I think it's a great story that she kind of kicked off her career a little bit, kind of climbing um, wind turbines and doing that. Um, and now she's doing um, research um, here at NREL in um, Colorado, which we're honored to have her on there. Um, she also guest lectures at Johns Hopkins and then um, for us here at the Global Energy Management Program as one of our instructors. So, um, Jill, thanks so much for being on the call today. 
And then we also have uh, Natasha Herring. So she is a senior consultant. She's an engineer um, at Guidehouse now, formerly Navigant. Um, and so um, she sits on their clean energy programs team, um, has over five years of industry experience um, doing the more evaluation and measurements. Um, she has strong feelings about STEM education for our women and girls, which we're really supportive of. Um, and um, she is also an alumni of um, the Global Energy Management Program here with her master's. So that's, that's very exciting. So to kick the webinar off, um, I'd like to just let you guys know, the way we'll do it is we'll have them, um, I'll have Jill and Tasha give some brief remarks um, at the very beginning and then we'll go into our question and answer session. But what I would like to do is really have everyone think of their questions as they come along and put them in the chat box. I think it's much more relevant if we have the conversation when that point was made as opposed to the end. And so we'll do that, but I will stop us 10 minutes before as well. Um, if there were any additional comments or questions that we didn't answer along the way. So let me stop sharing the screen here. Perfect. Um, and so let me get to my poll question and then we will get started. So, okay. so I'm just gonna launch that quickly. Give everyone just a quick moment um, to see what responses are. Interesting. And then I will end it and share the results. All right. Interesting. All right. And panelists, I'm not sure if you can see the poll yet or not, but I'm going to end it. And I am going to, so overall though, just the quick question was, how has COVID-19 crisis affected our electricity profile? Um, so the, interestingly, it's almost split half and half that um, folks say it has increased demand, the other half says it's decreased demand and, um, the small contingent says it's remained the same. So just wanted to take a quick poll um, so everybody can see that. Great. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing, close that. And great, so excited to get to questions here. So um, to kick us off, Jill, let's start with you. Um, Please feel free to mention anything I've missed in your bio. You have a very distinguished career um, here um, at NREL, and I wanna make sure we cover all of that. Um, and then maybe just give us a quick three to five high level overview. We'll get into the details in a little bit of how the electrification world is changing um, from where you sit at the federal level, but also the research perspectives that you bring from NREL. Great, thank you very much, Sarah. I'm very happy to be here. Um, uh, and very happy to participate in this program. Just as I, as Sarah mentioned, I, I, uh, I teach for the GEM program at, at CU Denver, um, which is a great opportunity to engage with energy professionals from around the world. Um, as she mentioned in my bio, I work at the National Renewable Energy Lab Laboratory. The, uh, the background behind me is our wind test site where we actually test full-scale wind turbines and how they connect uh, to the grid and how renewables and hydrogen and other types of energy systems uh, grid do grid connection and this connects to our supercomputer where we are studying electrification um, both of where we are now and where we might go in the future. Um, the institute I lead, the Joint Institute for Strategic Energy Analysis, our focus is the intersection of renewables and uh, other different types of uh, sectors. So we're looking at how renewables intersect with natural gas, with nuclear power, uh, with agriculture, manufacturing, and industry. So I'll be pulling on some of that experience in, in some of my comments going forward. Um, so in, in my uh, few minutes here to talk a little bit um, about kind of where we are in electrification, um, electricity in the U.S., the electricity demand in the U.S. has basically been flat over the past few decades. Um, and even though we have a lot more that we're plugging in, uh, our efficiency gains have been tremendous in terms of the types of appliances we're using, uh, the types of um, 
better efficient buildings, better efficient industries, and that has really offset the potential increase of electricity that we would have experienced with all the computers and laptops and other things that we're using. But we are, have the potential uh, for a really significant change uh, going forward. And, and this is particularly if we start to look at electrifying some of the major sectors. Um, and so at NREL, we are studying this in a program called the Electrification Future Study. It's a multi-report study um, that has uh, the first three reports have come out and there's several more to go. And in that study, we are looking at three areas, transportation, industry, and residential and commercial and what the potential is for electrification for those. Um, currently, our transportation sector is zero, almost 0% zero electric, even, even if a few of us do own electric cars, um, except for some public transit and EVs. But there's um, you know, a potential for uh, light duty vehicles, um, buses, and a few other large vehicles uh, going um, electric. So in our electrification future studies, we project that at the high end, you could have up to 75% of light duty vehicles being electrified. So a lot to, lot to think about there about how to, where do we charge those vehicles? When are they gonna be putting demand on the grid? How is that really gonna significantly change? On the residential commercial side, so that's buildings, that's largely around space heating and water heating. Currently that is a largely natural gas market. Um, all new builds are often electric, but there's still a, a large residual for uh, natural gas heating uh, in, in buildings. Um, so all of that is technically possible to electrify now, but there is some um, there's a lot of turnover and a lot of consumer acceptance experience that, uh, that Natasha is going to talk a little bit about. Um, and then the third area I want to mention is industry, industry, which is really the hardest. Industry has um, high demands for process heat in particular. Uh, so that's for curing, drying, boiling, pumping fans, all these things that are not currently electrified. Some, and this equipment life is very long, so it's going to take a very long to have this turnover to um, electrification. So um, there may be other options there that, uh, that we may have to look at besides um, moving to electricity. So in that study, our electricity looks at up to 20%, up to 38% electricity demand growth, particularly in transportation. This is, would basically double the share of electricity is in our final energy consumption from 20% to 40%. But if you, even if you look at that rate of growth, it is not beyond what we have experienced in the past. Um, and it may result in really a more efficient system. Um, but the, really, we don't know the exact way so that we're going to go forward. So we look at lots of different scenarios and what the technical options are there, um, what the economic challenges are, and then where we have to do, develop new technologies, particularly for industry, uh, to, to develop either electricity options or other options in clean fuels. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Jill. Um, and then Natasha, I'd uh, love to hear from you. Any, anything I left out in the bio? And then uh, again, you bring a different perspective from the consultant side. So maybe kind of what you're hearing from your clients um, and then maybe how that conversation has changed over the last two months or so since COVID is, has hit the, hit the market. Right. Hello, everybody. My name is Natasha Herring. As uh, Sarah mentioned, I'm a happy and proud GEM alumni. Um, so glad to be connected and glad to be back and helping. Um, I work at GuideHouse. I sit in the energy, sustainability, and infrastructure practice. Um, and so specifically, that means I work a lot with utilities and um, utility customers, utility programs, mostly on the residential, commercial, and industrial um, space. And so that's kind of my background. Um, and I think this is a, an interesting conversation. I think as far as trends that I'm um, seeing, I think on one side there's customers, right? And the customers are gaining a lot of awareness about where energy is coming from, where is their power coming from, how um, can they be a part of the solution even? So we have you know, customers installing solar, um, looking in and installing electric vehicles, other smart technologies, whether that's thermostats, kind of other you know, efficient light bulbs, things around the house um, or that are in their control where they can make a difference. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's awesome. And I think that's gonna continue to grow. It has been growing um, and it will continue to grow. And then I think on the utility side, we're seeing um, a lot more 
uh, utilities wanting to better understand their customers, whether that's when are they using power, what are their interests, what do they need kind of from an energy perspective. I think it's less from, you know, I need power, giving power, but like what else do you need? What are you using power for specifically? How can we design programs and technologies to better serve kind of the specific needs of customers. So I do think it's kind of this coming together of customers gaining um, more knowledge and awareness and is also utilities kind of trying to be more of a partner. Um, and I think even with coronavirus now um, coming up, you know, a lot more customers have received utility emails, you know, or information about ways that they can reduce energy or um, kind of push these demand side management programs um, awareness, you know, I think uh, sometimes energy efficiency has been looked at as a smaller piece of the energy puzzle. And I think, you know, that's fair in some respects, but there are huge gains. And now that people are home, it's really an opp opportune time to, you know, make sure that everything in your home is upgraded um, and efficient. And so I think there's a couple different considerations when I, I think about overall trends. One is education. You know, I just talked about how customers are becoming more educated, but I do think there's a lot of disparity in there. You have a lot of customers um, or a handful of customers that know a lot about electric vehicles and are purchasing and have, you know, availability and access to do that. But there's a lot of the general public that doesn't know a lot about the utility industry. All they do is see their bill and it went up, it went down. Um, and so I think the the education, I guess it needs to be a little bit of a leveling field um, when it comes to education. Um, and second is access. I do think there are gains to be made in the industry when it comes to access, just thinking about who can install solar, um, multifamily buildings or um, different condo, you know, arrangements where access to, to kind of pushing, being a part of the solution, being a part of this maybe energy transformation may not be as accessible to all customers, um, as well as cost. You know, um, we have some pioneers that are willing to fit the bill to you know get this equipment installed, um, but who's gonna kind of pay those maintenance, those recurring, the infrastructure cost, um, and that's you know no one wants wants to pay that bill. And then finally, regulation. We have to remember that many utilities are heavily regulated, and um, while there are really important global issues like climate change, which I'm sure we'll talk about, and some other things, but those aren't the only issue on the table. It's not a private company. They can't just pick up and change direction. Um, they have to account, be accountable to um, stakeholders, to the public utilities commissions, um, to their customers. So it's really a complex uh, industry and has, has some unique challenges, but I'm excited um, to see kind of what this new period of coronavirus um, what new innovations come out of this period of distress? Yeah, and I think you made a lot of really good points, Natasha. I know we'll kind of dive deeper into a few of them as we go along. But, you know, one of the things I liked um, that you mentioned is that, you know, I think people are a little bit more aware now that they're at home, right? So, and I think, Jill, you, you recognize that as well. It's like, suddenly you're like, oh, maybe I can upgrade, you know, do some energy efficiency work. I'm realizing, oh, my house might be more drafty than I thought, or I haven't upgraded my light bulbs and, and things like that do make a, a big difference um, along the way. Because energy efficiency, as we say, is not sexy, but it's the best energy is the energy we don't use, right? So um, absolutely, I think people are, are more aware and this is a good opportunity to, to increase the awareness there. Um, Jill, I know you hit already a little bit on some of the technical and economic um, impacts, or excuse me, um, technical and economic potential um, that we have um, in the electrification sector but any any anything else you want to elaborate on those on those pieces i know we have those those main um, sectors the transportation um, is a big one um, but any any further elaboration on those on um yeah so you know again transportation's really been um and a, a really big focus on electrification specifically around uh, because we are seeing advancements in electric vehicles. They are about 2% of the sales of new vehicles in the US, uh, even higher in other countries. Um, and I think the big challenges that we're, that we're really focused on with transportation as we see this electrification is, as I mentioned, is how is that gonna integrate into the grid? How, is, how are utilities, um, if we get a very high percentage of electric vehicles into the market, how are utilities gonna deal with the changing in the, in, in, in the uh, charging infrastructure um, are you going to have it distributed? Are people going to be charging at home or at work? And then how is that, how are you going to incentivize people to charge when there is excess electricity and you don't end up with these very high peak and ramp rates um, of, of electricity demand in very strange um, locations? 
Um, the other thing I think, um, and I mentioned this a little bit, so this gets away from electrification a little bit, but um, the importance of, especially in the, in the industry, industrial sector on, um, on liquid fuels and the need for process heat. So um, liquid fuels are really an amazing storage technology. So if you look at um, gas, natural gas, for example, it's very energy dense. It works with existing, uh, in, it works, we've got an infrastructure to, to use it. Um, and um, in some cases, it's going, you're going to need to uh, continue to have these types of fuels for, again, high process heat. It's very difficult to use solar photovoltaics or wind turbines to um, generate the types of heat for a steel mill or a cement plant, for example. Um, so we're like, doing research on technologies that's looking at using electricity to generate hydrogen um, when you have very low cost electricity uh, that you, um, because there's not a high demand, uh, so, for example, electricity market has seen electricity prices go to zero, just as we're seeing, um, and negative, just as we're seeing the oil and gas, the gas market now experiencing. Um, we can use those electrons when we have them at low cost to do a process called electrolysis, where you're water splitting to create hydrogen, and then that hydrogen is, is able to be stored, and then that can be either converted back into electricity, or it can be combusted for process heat uh, in an industrial process. Um, we're also looking at technologies where you can actually capture CO2 off of a, a plant that's, that's combusting coal or oil and gas or, or just producing CO2 from this natural process, combining that with a hydrogen, clean green hydrogen, um, and then produce, basically create a synthetic methane or green methane that you can use pipe, through the pipelines through existing infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, so the advantage is that, you know, that uses existing infrastructure using uh, existing systems uh, but yet, and it actually fills that niche for heat, um, but yet it is created uh, through electricity or through other green um, renewable, potentially renewable process processes. So um, those are the types of things that we're looking at to address uh, those hard to decarbonize, hard to electrify processes. Yeah, and then I did get a, a question, Jill. Um, from Pat, from our audience, um, he, he's interested in electrification of the, the transport area as well. Uh, he says electrification of transportation cleans up emissions uh, by most by pairing with renewables. How are utilities planning on handling higher EV penetration and renewable load balancing? Yes, so they are, um, utilities are looking at this closely. We are certainly not at the penetration rates that it's a big issue at this point. Um, but they are looking at, uh, you know, as we're seeing, for example, utilities moving to time of use rates, which is your, you, you pay for the electricity at a different rate depending on the time of day. That will actually be very helpful when we have, uh, when we have larger percentages of electric vehicles being charged at home, because then you're going to incentivize electric vehicle charging uh, when you have more electricity, you're not having the high demand. So at night right now, for example, is when you have high electricity, you have low electricity demand, but you could still be running the facilities um, that you have. So uh, time of use rates will are one method that will, utilities will use to encourage people to charge their vehicles um, at night or when electricity demand is, is low. The interesting thing is in, we may see a period where we've got such a significant amount of renewables, particularly solar, uh, where you have maybe a lot of excess electricity in the middle of the day when you've got a, say you've got a bright, sunny, windy day and you've got sort of normal demand. Um, you may then want to try to incentivize people to charge their vehicles or uh, other uses at that time of day. So we're going to have to get a lot smarter in the future about dynamic pricing uh, where at least some people or some companies or organizations can use the low price electricity when they know it's going to be low um, and to be able to um, that will really help levelize the demand, the supply and demand uh, balancing uh, through that. So I think electric vehicles prevent, present both a challenge, but they also present a great opportunity to be able to uh, help achieve this load balancing. Yeah, and just you know, a quick note. I know um, we talk about flattening the curve for COVID and healthcare, but you know, it seems like this is also helping to flatten kind of the duck curve in reverse, right? Um, yeah. When we think of electrification at the same time, so it's kind yeah, of a the need greatest risk is always when you have a very rapid increase in something and the system can't handle it, which is exactly the uh, analogy. Yeah, so I mean, it's interesting. This is probably a science experiment that can never have happened on the electricity market before um, to see what it's like to. To kind of flatten that curve um, while we're all at home here. So, well, great. Well, um, 
want to jump over to Natasha. Um, you talked a little bit, of, you know, already from your um, client's perspective, um, but interested um, to hear a little bit more kind of the perceptions that you're hearing from your clients about this, about electrification. Are they taking this on board? Are they taking this seriously? Is this um, something they're heavily investing in? Sure, and I'll, I'll start by right, popping in to answer part of that question too. Um, at least, you know, that makes me think about, um, when you talk about EVs, transportation, how utilities are gonna respond. Um, I feel like the utility industry is just a little bit different than maybe some other industries um, because utilities really have been fitting the bill for the infrastructure maintenance of, you know, we, we have cars, there are roads that the federal government maintains. Um, you know, there are things that, that other industries rely on um, government help for maintenance, and so they can really focus on um, the product. And I feel like utilities are in a unique space because they are responding, uh, are responsible for maintenance of the grid, which um, is aging and needs a lot of help and attention. And right now, during coronavirus, is really being used heavily, right? Like utilities are actively front respond, like first responders. They are, you know, in many ways, electricity is the lifeblood of um, the United States. And you know, mm -hmm. we for home, we expect Wi-Fi, <laughs> we expect all of the, you know, everything to be connected to power, hospitals. Um, how they're responding and so i guess first i just, just want to applaud utilities for um responding and kind of like putting some of the you know payment or kind of other logistical things that would be barriers to uh, to power for everyone and really kind of pushing coming together to put forth um power first or making sure people have access to power um and then i think when it comes to electric vehicles you know this is unique because utilities again are responsible for the infrastructure so it's not like the government's putting the bill and they just need to you know work to connect with automakers and um customers and so it's i think it's just an interesting um conundrum a little bit just because of the way the industry um is designed i guess um so just popping that in i think uh as far as um just some other thoughts about uh the future i think the future is really connected um i do think that the the grid is um it, i expect some innovations to come mm -hmm. in the grid you know jill talked about a handful um i think we're going to see a lot more in like dr microgrids um coming up and even this idea of virtual power plants which is a little bit new to me but um it's essentially a expanded control center for if a lot more, I guess it's like a, an advancement on the microgrid, um, mm -hmm. where if a lot more people or communities have um, solar and electric vehicles and, you know, different uh, electricity generating, whether it's batteries or other electricity generating items, um, and how those connect to the grid. I think um, utilities, I feel like, have a unique issue or a unique challenge ahead of them um, in how to integrate kind of the future as people become more aware, want to partake, how how are they going to keep in line charging and uh, control of the grid um, from, you know, customers now being more part of the generation um, and just managing that load. So I, I see, I guess, a lot of innovation when it comes to controls in the future of electrification and utility management. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a great point, um, both, you know, you made earlier about um, utilities being very complex. They're very complex. Um, it's also very old structures, you know, not every region has the same structures, um, the same regulations, the same laws. Um, and then there's everything from, an, you know, an IOU to your kind of small um, rural power and things like that. So it's, it's definitely a complex system. Um, and so integrating some of these new technologies is also complicated. Um, but I think you're right, and Jill, you might want to chime in on this too, is that it's kind of ripe for innovation at this point. Um, it's such an old industry that's been doing things very similarly for many, many years that it really is prime for innovation and, and change. I um, guess, uh, Jill, anything you wanted to add on kind of emerging kind of uh, grid innovation that you're seeing or research? I know you guys are doing a lot out there at NREL. Just any studies or things briefly you wanted to mention? Yeah, just a lot of things. And, and, yeah. and uh, as you mentioned, the utilities are now starting to really innovate. So we're actually working quite closely with the utilities um, who are 
thinking about what are they going to need to do this. So, you know, smart meters, smart grids, um, different types of policies, different types of use rates. Um, most utilities now have uh, have set goals for either high renewables or high decarbonization or you know what or high clean depending how they want to define it. Um, and we're trying to help them sort out what that means in terms of being able to do the modeling. Um, and the, the big challenge now that we're working um, with the utilities to think about innovation is, is how do you get that last 20%? I mean, getting to 80% renewables, 80% um, variable renewables, even if you just look at wind and solar, um, how do you think about that last 20%? I mean, is it gonna be hydropower? Is it gonna be geothermal? Is it gonna be storage? Is it going to be um, other types of technology? So looking at the, the long-term storage challenges for things, you know, seasonal storage, storage that you need month to month, year to year, um, is really some of the, the innovative areas that the utilities are asking for and that, that uh, people are working on to, to come up with solutions for that. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's, that's, you hope you can innovate your way out there at the end. Um, that's, that's for sure. Uh, well, Jill, Ken, I want to stick with you and talk a little bit more. What are some of the key features of energy technology supply chains? So we've talked you know, a little bit about the grid, but kind of the, the technology supply chains. Um, and then what are some of the risks um, in those supply chains? Obviously, we're seeing some of those impacts now with COVID-19. Um, so if you could just, uh, yeah, mention some of those key features. Sure. So supply chains is something that, um, uh, you know, people have been looking at for quite some time. It's really important if you're in the industry. Uh, but perhaps with COVID-19, suddenly people are really aware of supply chains now. If you're, if you're trying to get hand sanitizer in the store, suddenly you're aware of how sand sanitizer is made and where it comes from and how it's shipped around the world. So supply chains, um, the, the short version is supply chains are global uh, and they're very complicated and they really vary by technology if you're just looking at the energy technologies. Um, so we've got a, a, some reports that we've put out. We do some deep dives on various technologies and look at the supply chains. So if you start at the front end of the supply chains, the upper energy technologies, the raw materials, um, this is an area that's frequently mentioned around renewables. Uh, those are global. You get cobalt from, from Africa for batteries, uh, lithium from South America, rare earth elements from China, um, copper and aluminum from North America. Um, and then, the, then those are processed in different countries. Um, so often they're shipped as some lightly processed ore and then they're refined in another, another place. Uh, for example, silicon is largely refined. It's got large refineries in the United States and Germany. Um, then those refined minerals are sent for, uh, to be made into components or subcomponents uh, and then assembled into the final energy technologies. And often that, um, so for example, for PV, while the polysilicon is in uh, the US and Europe, um, then it, it gets sent to Asia where it's made into ingots and cells and modules, which then may get set back to North America where they are assembled and then installed um, on someone's roof or on a utilities plant. So um, very few things are made in one place all the way end to end. Um, wind turbine blades are frequently made locally where they're used, uh, but a lot of the little components in the nacelles in the turbine part are globally sourced. Um, so with COVID, what we saw on re renewables specifically is that um, a lot of the, some of the manufacturing plants did uh, stop production, particularly in Asia. Um, they also potentially had reduced access to raw materials. The so shipping was disrupted. Mm -hmm. um, some plants continued to produce. So First Solar, for example, continued to produce uh, in its plants in Malaysia and Ohio. Um, other plants, such as China, completely stopped. Um, SunPower's facilities stopped for a few weeks, uh, and these are all just kind of coming back up now. So we saw some of the same behavior as we're seeing with people in their grocery store. There was some hoarding. <laughs> there was a panic buying and hoarding, and then we're now potentially gonna see the supply opening up. So the predictions are that either prices for panels will go down um, because there's suddenly going to be a huge uh, surplus or that they're going to go up because there's going to be a shortage or they're going to stay the same. I mean, in the past uh, decade, we've seen continuous decline of panels, panel prices on a per watt basis. We think that will happen. We don't know with the with supply chain. So there's a lot of challenges around um, the, the technology supply chain right now, and a lot of uncertainty. Um, and then finally, one little final bit on this is that um, we're seeing potential slowdown in construction of new facilities. 
not so much in 2020, um, but potentially in 2021, because a lot of the new, uh, the financing for the projects that would be constructed in nine to 18 months has, have been put on hold, uh, more due to the economic side than the supply chain side. Um, so that may suppress demand for the technologies going forward, which may also then suppress prices. Uh, so a lot of uncertainty really around the supply chain on the, with the COVID reaction. So I'll stop there for now. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. I think um, people before kind of knew where their supply chains were, like you said, and now certainly know where every every bit of their business is coming and going from constantly. So that's, um, and I think, yeah. And and same says for the fossil side, they certainly were were also just as affected. Um, and so, so. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Um, and so Natasha, um, kind of talking about that a little bit, kind of the impacts of supply chain on u- utility programs and customers. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So um, I guess from where I sit, I'm more from the the demand side. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you know for those programs that are still going, which are largely residential programs and then largely commercial dealing with HVAC programs. Um, Some of the other programs have just slowed down. There's just not a lot of demand um, for them. But for large HVAC programs, we're seeing, you know, just delays, you know, where before getting a new HVAC system might have taken three weeks, four weeks. Now, you know, are delayed eight, ten 12 weeks, Um, just kind of, as Jill mentioned, there's different parts that comes from different countries, um, and especially those uh, equipment that's made in Europe and Asia, it's just those delays. Um, So we are seeing some of those. I think it's hard to tell at this moment what the impact is, right? Obviously a customer will get um, their equipment late, but I think this may have other repercussions with forecasting, um, possibly with like not hitting a program's goals for the years or utilities like energy savings goals just because of this. So I think some of that is still yet to see. Um, but right now it's primarily delays. And um, I don't think there's anything super critical at the moment because um, everyone's aware of what's going on, but um, more to tell in the future. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. Um, I did want to because this question from the audience, I think will um, kind of transition us to a little bit of the comments, which are, are a little bit surrounding um, some of the climate discussion, I think that we're hearing um, based on electrification right now and some opportunities and stuff that the, that the globe really has. Um, uh, I can read the full thing just so you have the context for kind of what she was thinking, which is, Um, In 2019 and 2022, um, some insurance companies will no longer underwrite generation companies producing more than 30% of their electricity from coal. So kind of greening the grid perspective. Um, And it said BlackRock also announced it will divest uh, investments in companies that earn more than 25% of the revenues from thermal coal. Um, Some say that this is the only way emissions can be reduced is for fossil fuel investments to stop and for green energy investments to be significantly boosted. How do you guys feel on that topic? Do you think that's, you know, one way that it can happen or is that the only way? Um, I guess I can start. Um, I I think it's, I think it's, I think it's one way, um, but not the only way. I mean, we're we're currently in the U S and in many countries, uh, especially in Europe, um, are seeing the decline of coal, um, in, that might be in part due to investors, but it's really probably more so the fact that the plants um, are having trouble competing with low cost natural gas power and with low cost renewables. I mean, while renewables are more capital investment uh, intensive to build, they have z- uh, zero fuel cost um, and zero fuel cost risk. Um, the sun is not gonna suddenly become more expensive um, in, in the future. Um, so that's the, the way that the, uh, we, we've seen a decline in emissions on the electricity sector in large part due to simple economics um, and the, there's not investment because there's not as good a payout um, and return on investment as some of these other, other technologies. Um, so in, in a sense, some of these announcements are, uh, might hasten things along, but uh, not completely, uh, it, it's already uh, in process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just, just to add to that, I, I agree with Jill. Um, I don't think it's the only way, um, but I do think, you know, money talks and, you know, putting where you invest really um, is making a statement. I think now we are at an energy transition, and so I think it is important for investors to think about 
of where, you know, they're putting their money, where are they actually going to get return in five to 10 years? Um, and I think the whole industry really is thinking about as well, like, you know, if they're, if we are able to use, you know, stimulus money, are we trying to just maintain the status quo or, or are we really going to, you know, step into the future and like see how um, we can make climate conscious decisions um, and kind of like progress, uh, I guess, our society forward um, in a clean manner. So um, I do think it is, uh, it's, yeah, it's definitely not the only way, but I do think it is a strong move towards a um, more energy conscious future. Yeah, and I, and I, I guess I would concur with you guys that I think it's an economic discussion. Um, Jill, you know, if the economics are there, businesses are going to make that economic choice and decision as well. Um, and we've seen, you know, the cost of renewables, you know, levelized costs come down dramatically and, and pretty much wind and solar competing on the open market, um, that, that level playing field with. Um, I think it's important to remember how we got there, though, because, um, because there is a policy element in there and there might be an investor demand and consumer demand there, which in the sense that Renewables, of course, were not the cheapest option in the beginning. Um, and the, the way they got there was the basically um, through uh, economies of scale, being able to ramp up production to the such that you're producing panels at such a low price um, because you were able to build large factories and build them continuously. And you, to do that, you need the high production, you need the high demand. Um, and so we had a lot of policies and government policies and also corporate policies that said, we are going to buy uh, renewables, we're going to be 100% whatever, or 50% uh, clean energy, um, because they made a commitment even before it was completely an economic decision, uh, you know, supported by government policies. And then that drove the economies of scale, which then drove the prices down which until um, many of the renewables can compete on an open market. So yeah. I think there's a role of investors and policy and decision makers, um, especially in the early stage of, of any new technology. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it, it's important to note too, it's, it's hard to um, do all of this without like an overall strategy of what, what are we trying to do and is policy acting the same way business is acting? And, you know, are we all trying to move towards this low carbon future and, you know, making sure that that's, that's at the forefront. Um, we do have another question that's going to lead us into the couple other wrap-up questions and things that we had. Um, so going to jump to that one. Um, it's kind of this future forward question, which is what are the major challenges do you see in transitioning from a fuel-based endpoint energy consumption to an electricity endpoint energy consumption? And what tools can be le leveraged to make this transition occur in the near and long-term time frame? Tasha, you want to start that one? <laughs> Sorry. So the first thing that came to mind was infrastructure. Um, I just think that's huge um, because we can have champions and pioneers, and that's great. But in order for something to be sustainable, we have to have the infrastructure um, and access so that everyone can, um, can buy in. And so, you know, now we have gas stations all around. Um, and so, you know, seeing how, um, you know, I guess we can one shift behavior and say that, you know, um, we're only going to install electric vehicle chargers or um, in certain places, or if we're keeping kind of the same behavior that we have right now, how are we going to roll out the infrastructure at the level um, where, you know, the change for consumer behavior um, is not large. Um, so that's kind of the first, uh, the first thing that comes to mind. Um, I think there, as far as tools that can be leveraged, um, I think there's going to be needs to be a lot of stakeholder conversations, um, as I mentioned before, and as it's come up, like regulation. Jill mentioned policy. There's just a lot of um, people that have a voice and have a say, and that have different opinions that have also or uh, different objectives um, that have also come up. And so, um, I think that uh, yeah, but there's I mean, needs to be a lot of conversations, and I feel like technology um, and the rate of technology changing can really help, um, I guess, either complicate or simplify kind of how that moves forward. Um, so those are my, my thoughts. But infrastructure, I see, is the primary major challenge um, in getting people kind of to, to, to move towards the big picture in a way that's complementary to one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would add to that, um, in, which is related to infrastructures, thinking about the existing uh, companies and uh, 
other major players in the economy, how are they going to manage this transition? Um, and this is always a challenge when you have a new new technologies coming over, new approaches, is that some companies are going to be able to anticipate that and uh, be able to transform themselves into the new economy. We're starting to see some, for example, oil and gas companies that are very focused, and also their supplier companies, starting to think about how what is their role going to be in, in a more electrified uh, future. Um, and you know they're sort of finding their way about what their current capabilities are and where they best align um, align with that. Uh, and then you know and so so thinking about how the the uh, the companies and organizations that are really large parts of our economy are going to manage manage that transition and going forward, I think is really important too. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think you both make some really good points there, and, and Natasha liked yours on infrastructure for sure. Um, that that's going to be a major issue, but, and it also um, highlights some of the other more complex issues of like haves and have nots. And then how do we make sure that we are serving, especially in a, in a electrified world, um, you know, energy poverty is so real even here in the U S. And so as we add on more renewables, does it add on costs? Does it, as we upgrade the grid or we look to see who's responsible, how does that add on costs and how does that affect that, that direct consumer? Cause we do have a lot of responsibility um, to them as well. And, you know, making sure we're serving them as well as folks who um, might have some, some more financial. Yeah, and there's, there's some interesting transition points to think about too, because say uh, a state or a region decides to move away from natural gas for heating and, and uh, mm -hmm. other uses. At some point, so say you sort of get partway through that transition, but at some point the pipeline becomes not used enough to even be economically operated. So at some point you might have to have a sudden shutoff um, or you have to subsidize an existing infrastructure until you get everyone converted. So there's gonna be some hiccups um, at various stages uh, when everything will either have to convert very quickly or you're gonna to have to understand how the infrastructure um, sort of connects to each other. What do you do with these sort of stranded, stranded assets? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, well, just, just two questions left here. So if anybody else has additional questions, please um, send them in because I just have two questions for Jill and Natasha. Um, and so one is, you know, we talked about this future forward a, a little bit. Um, you know, AI is kind of the big buzzword that's out there. Um, so wondering, is there any potential for AI to help kind of mitigate some of the supply chain risks that we have? Um, and if so, you know, what, what does that look like and what do those conditions look like that that, that would be useful? I'll pitch it to both of you. I can start. Um, I think that, yeah, I think that there are innovations yet to be made. Um, I think AI, I think, you know, just technology in general, drones, other things that can definitely be used to um, either do maintenance on the grid, update. I mean, there's certain, I feel like there's a culture shift I think happening because it has to for coronavirus, but that might actually come um, in the next couple of years when it comes to just the way that we even operate the grid um, and the way that, um, you know, remote learning or remote working, excuse me, um, are gonna, I guess, come in. And so I, I am expectant for innovation to, um, to come to the energy industry. I don't have any specific ideas per se, but I do think there are, um, grand opportunities for IA, for technology, for um, innovation to, to come, um, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, just building on that maybe a little bit, um, you know, AI, autonomous, autonomous vehicles or autonomous uh, operations, uh, increased automation, um, that's going to continue. That's been going on for a long time. Um, thinking about the COVID example, I mean, the more you have automation and things operating um, with robots and uh, uh, other types of AI. You, you have less worker exposure. Workers can work from more remotely and be able to, to continue, continue manufacturing, except for cases where maybe you needed to correct the problem. Um, you know, these types of innovations could lead us to uh, both in this current health crisis, but also, um, you know, for example, mining mining could largely be done autonomously and would have much better worker health outcomes if you had somebody operating mining equipment um, 
with a joystick from a nice office as opposed to being underground or in a large open pit mine. So, you know, mining is not going to go away. We're going to need it for uh, the re for all technology futures. And so thinking about how AI can min minimize that risk um, and minimize and, and improve jobs and improve life for, for workers overall. Yeah, it, it's, you know, it also goes back to that piece, Jill, that you mentioned earlier. You said, you know, things aren't all manufactured in one place um, as well. Um, and so th maybe some of this can help us do that, uh, keep it more centralized. Um, but then also, you know, I think about I have some friends who work in nuclear power plants. Um, and if any of that can use AI to kind of um, increase uh, uh, employee safety, um, but just overall safety in, in general on how things are done and, and managed, I think that's a that's huge potential there. Um, we're just kind of keeping with that theme of what does our future look like? Um, you know, just, you know, what are the risks and opportunities for the energy future? You know, whether it's economic, environmental, um, social, cultural, um, there's so many different aspects to it, but what are some of the risks and opportunities you guys are seeing for kind of the future of energy? Well, um, start, I guess I'll start. Um, I think one of the, I'll start with the risk because that way I'll end up on the positive. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, I think one of the risks is that we're going to replace one massive energy system with another massive mm. energy system. Um, and you need, we need to take, so we're, you know, we're going to take this oil and gas coal and coal based system and we may be replacing it with a renewables electricity based system. Now, obviously this won't happen overnight and you won't, it's never gonna to go to zero. Um, you know, we still use, we still burn wood for, for various things. So, we're, you know, we didn't get rid of future past fuel sources. But, but if we're gonna replace one massive energy system with another, we have to think about what the future effects might be of that, even if we don't know what those effects might be. So with renewable energy, there's a lot of concern about raw materials and the input materials. And so we need to be thinking now about how to develop the technologies to minimize the use of hazardous materials, to minimize the impact from mining, to minimize the impact from supply chains issues. Um, we need to be thinking about land use um, and how we can uh, co-crop land use. We're uh, looking at how you have agriculture and renewables working together, um, and developing ways to really, to make sure that we, um, don't have the same negative impacts. Just, so just as we went from horses and the, uh, the extreme pollution that they created in cities and urban areas in the late 1800s, and we ended up putting out all sorts of air pollution instead, um, what is going to be the effect from uh, this transition to new technologies? And I think we need to be able to think about that and, 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 and face it early and then mitigate it before it becomes a major issue. Um, that said, in terms of the opportunities, there's a huge opportunity for us to have cleaner air, cleaner water, uh, better use of land, uh, more locally generated energy, more resilient energy because it's more networked and uh, connected together. People will have more control over their energy demand and their energy use um, and be able to, uh, to optimize it for their own, their own uses, their communities, their countries, and, and going forward. So I think there's a, 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 an amazing bright future out there as long as we're very careful in the transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I'll chime in. I think that on the risk side, um, you know, especially social, cultural, I think, you know, we have a, a large energy industry and a lot of institutional knowledge. And I feel like pending kind of what happens over the next couple of weeks, a couple of months, um, we've already experienced a lot of layoffs. I feel like institutional knowledge, you know, we don't know what's going to ramp up, if it's um, solar renewables should, um, we don't know what's going to happen with oil and gas. I just feel like there's a, a large risk in the, the institutional knowledge um, that, that the industry has or is losing or, you know, might lose temporarily and then need to bounce back. And so I think that's, um, that's one that, that's pretty big. Um, and even getting people on board with like how, you know, technology, how, how I guess the business works. Um, and then I think just, just the unknown. I mean, the, forecasts, it's hard to tell what's going to happen on the utility side on consumption, usage, what's going to happen in the industry, kind of in every different sector. Um, and I think that's just a huge risk. Um, we do know that the energy transition, I guess, is here or it's coming and this is an opportune time. But how, um, 
how things are going to end up at the end, I guess, is a, is a big risk. But I do think there is a risk of not doing anything. <laughs> and so I think that also, um, you know, if you're not a part, not active, not kind of learning, trying to understand, kind of see what you can do, I think that is a huge um, risk as well. And I love how Jill pointed out the land. Yesterday was Earth Day. I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. it's an interesting perspective. <laughs> we are like, you know, um, you know, just thinking about the earth and, and how we've used it in the past and, and the future to come. And so um, just to echo Jill's points on opportunities, I feel like this is really the time to seize kind of this energy transition. This is really a time to um, maybe even accelerate some of the plans that maybe were drawn out over the next 15 to 30 years for um, businesses, for utilities, you know, um, to make more climate conscious decisions. This is the time now. Why not use, um, use this time, use the funds, use this setback, um, a global setback in some respects to, um, to prepare for the future and to make those significant changes so that our future um, can be cleaner sooner. Um, so I think that's, that's a huge opportunity, huge, huge time for innovation. Yeah, and, and those are great points. And they kind of speak to, we did have a, a couple of quick questions come in, um, but I think they kind of lend to kind of what you both said. Um, and David mentions, you know, de decline in drilling costs over the past few years, you know, perhaps how can we leverage that more towards geothermal or ESG? So that, that, that's a, a potential and you ladies might have some thoughts on that. And then um, the same Phil asked, you know, is there any research yet? And maybe it's too soon on um, the climate impact, you know, as we shift more towards electrification, um, especially now with this big pause um, that we're having, um, you know, how, how significant this could be, maybe if we continue to operate in this capacity or, you know, kind of trending in that capacity, could this, you know, is there any research to, to say kind of how that's gonna affect the climate? Um, so I don't know if you guys want to add any comments on that or I can give you, I can give you, I know we got shorter times. So yep. I can give you flash answers on those. Yes. Um, uh, geothermal. Yes, we are. Um, there is a potential there, uh, there, uh, I can just say that we've been contacted by a number of organizations suddenly interested in geothermal. Um, and I've actually been saying this for a number of years. So I think this is great. We, uh, it's like it is it's completely different rock it's it's different drill bits it's different temperatures there's a whole lot of technical issues but um definitely uh, definitely seeing an increase there and definitely a, a, a potential um and then uh uh climate impact of mining and resource development we've got a program we're trying to uh, get partners in the mining industry to come together to look at ways to uh to power mine operations with renewable energy or other types of clean energy so uh there's starting to be interest in that in part driven from the downstream uh, companies who are making technologies asking for the mining companies to send them uh, green raw materials or materials produced um, with low emissions. So um, demand uh, from the, uh, the, the far end asking for the upstream to, to change their, uh, the way they operate. So yes, we're seeing both. Great. Natasha, any, any thoughts you'd like to add there? Nothing to add there. Jill, Jill did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, first, I just want to thank um, my panelists uh, so much for um, jumping on the call today um, and being the experts that they are um, in their fields. Uh, we're so excited um, to have you a part of the GEM community, um, but also um, to be able to be here and hear um, what you had to share today. So um, thanks for everyone for participating. Um, just a quick reminder, we do have part three of this webinar series coming up on May 7th. Um, that's with Johanna Schmidke. She's managing director at ARA um, and Chase Boswell at Thunder River. So definitely if you have an opportunity to jump on that call or jump on that webinar, we'd love to see you answer some more questions there. And then as you think about retooling, we are um, kind of focusing a little bit more on the big data side since everyone's virtual these days and then how we can leverage um, technology um, and the data that we have um, in, in the energy space. So um, with that, again, a big thank you to um, Jill and Natasha for being on the call. Um, and then if, you, if we can ever answer any questions or provide resources for you, my contact info is there. So um, looking forward to seeing everyone online. So stay healthy, happy, and sane over the next little bit. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.